Hello and welcome. Today we're looking at the implication table and we've drawn the implication table on the right of our primitive flow table. The purpose of the implication table is to reveal the possibility of compatibility between the rows of the flow table. So we're going to show you how to use it now. Watch closely and learn. There's three possible things you can put into your implication table. You can put a tick, an X, or a dependency. Now notice where the rows and columns intersect at the very top square. I have written A, C in the square that relates to AB. The B, the B has intersected the A and that square is the AB square. So the that square I'm comparing the A and B rows. And the reason why I have written AC is there, look, A, C. Meaning that in the first column, because we have a don't care condition here, uh, that we can merge that to G. In the second, we can merge it to F. In the last one, we can merge it to B1, because the B has a 1 there. But in the middle uh, column, sorry, the column there where it says 1, 1, notice, when, if we merge... Whether we can merge or not is going to depend on C. We don't know what C is yet. We, we, we don't, we're not checking C, but we see that in order for us to merge the rows A and B together into a single row, it, A and C would have to be compatible with each other. So we write A, C in here so that we can check the compatibility later on. So let's move on. In the next square, we have put an X, a big bold X. Why did we do that? Well, that is the intersection of the A and the C row. So basically, we're trying to merge the A and the C row. We are comparing them. So once again, we have no problem in the first column. When we compare the A and C row, we see that we don't care. When we compare for the second column, we see that we have an F and an H. So why haven't we written down an F and an H dependency inside of that square? Because when we come to the third row, we observe that we have a zero output with the A and a one output with the C. That really is the reason why the X is in there. You cannot merge rows with different outputs. So if the two rows we are comparing have differing outputs, one is a zero and the other is a one, that's a conflict. So those rows can never merge under any circumstances. So we don't have to be bothered with checking dependencies or anything else. As long as we can find a zero and a one in the output of the two rows, we're attempting to merge a big X goes into the square for those two rows on the implication table. Okay, so we've filled out some more. We have a dependency there for A and D, and we have a dependency there for A and E. And now we have a tick, so the, we just have to explain the tick. And then we can move on. So the tick is in the intersection of the A and the F. So we are comparing the A and the F rows. So let's have a look. In the A row, in the first column, we have uh, don't care. In the F row, we have an E. Now we go to the second column. We have an F and we have a... F0, so that's compatible. We have an A0, and we have an A down here in the F, so that's compatible. And in the last column, we have the B, and we have a don't care condition in the F row. So the A and the F row can be unconditionally merged into one row. 
because there is no conflict, no conflict at all exists between merging the A and the F row together as shown. No conflict. So when there's that, we simply put a tick to say that we're happy. Now you should have the pattern already sorted out in your mind. So we now can go on and fill the whole table and you can rewind the video, stop the video, pause the video and check to make sure that you agree. Make sure you agree with this before moving on. But once you agree that I've filled it out correctly, you see that there's only X's, ticks or dependencies in any square. And every square relates to a comparison of two rows. Let's move on. The next step we do is check the dependencies. Now notice that I've put X's on all the AC dependencies. Why did I put X's on all the AC dependencies in the entire implication table? Well, as you see, if you compare the A and the C row, we have that output discrepancy there. And if you go and look at where we compared the A and the C row in the table, we had an X. So if AC is totally incompatible, then all the dependencies are going to have to be totally incompatible as well. So we can easily see that A is totally incompatible with C, and therefore all squares that have a dependency on AC have to be incompatible as well. So it turns out that in this particular uh, flow table, uh, the incompatibility extends, the same reasoning, the same argument for AC extends for all the others. So now we can go and we can put X's on all the others. And in the end, if you check your implication table, you will see that the whole table boils down to either ticks or X's because the X's are on all implications. There are no valid implications in this table. Now, even if you were to find a valid implication, if the implication was valid in a square where you had an invalid implication, then the square would still be invalid. So in other words, consider the square here where there are two implications. If either of those implications proved true, this square would still be false. The only way that this square could ever become a tick is if both these implications also received ticks. You have to have ticks on all two and the square would have to be totally compatible before you could replace it with a tick. So now I think you know how to do implication tables. Let's move on. We're now considering a merger diagram. That circle over there on the right is a merger diagram. So what are we doing with the merger diagram? Well, we see that we have a line drawn in the merger diagram from D to E. That means that there was a tick in the D to E square. And there is. Look at it right there. So there is E. There is D. And we have a tick. So basically... What we're going to do is we're going to connect, we're going to connect the states around the circle that are ticked, okay? So what do we do next? We have an A to F, and we check the A to F, and there we see that the A and F have a tick as well. So wherever a square has a tick, you want to draw a line between those two states. And when we finish out the table, step by step, we end up with those lines. Now, what does our merger diagram tell us? Basically, we have to look at the merger diagram for shapes. The only shapes we are interested in, apart from the lines that connect two states, is the triangle and a rectangle with both diagonals included. 
We have no rectangle in there with both diagonals included, but we have two triangles and two separate line segments. The triangle means that the three states connected by the triangle are a set, whereas the single line only connects the two states, so it's a set of two. So we have a state AF, because that's just the line between the two, a set AF. Then we have DEF is a triangle. And then we have CH, which is just a set of two. And then we have BGH, which is another triangle. So we get four sets out of this merger diagram. If the merger diagram had in a rectangle with diagonals filled in, then you could get four states bracketed, which means that four rows would be totally compatible and able to be reduced. So what the merger diagram tells us is that we can merge the eight states, A to H, into four states. Each of those sets will now constitute a merged state. So let's move on. How do we merge into, how do we merge these rows? Well, you've already seen how to merge two of them. And uh, what we do is we write the A and F, and when we merge, we write the merged row in our merger table, our reduced flow table. So let us look at the DEF. The reason why we're looking at the DEF is because they're all under each other, DEF. And you see that we have E, E0, and E, so we just write in E0. We have F, F0, and don't care, so we just write in F0. We have A, don't care, A, so we just write A, don't care. And here we have D0, D, don't care, and don't care altogether. So we write D0 in the rightmost column of our merged table. Finally, we now change our table so that we replace the AF set with simply A, the BGH with simply B, and the CH with C, and the DEF with D to produce our reversed flow table. So on the top row, wherever we have E, we would see which one E is in. E is in the bottom one, so we would replace our E with a D. F is on the same row. F0 now becomes A0. Right? F, F0 becomes A0. A0 is A0. And the B is there already. And the B is in the second row, um, which is why the B is unchanged. So if we go through and we substitute uh, in the second row B for G and H, because they're all being merged, and uh, C remains the same because the next row is the C row, and uh, in the C row, the H becomes a C, and we just drop the H because it's all in the same row, and the D remains a D because the D row is the very next row, but notice that the G... That was here, the G here. Here is the, here is the G, look at the G. Uh, the G row is the one above. So where we, have the, the, where we have the G square, we have to replace the one above because the one above is, the, is now the B row. So we put a B there instead of the G and the G has disappeared altogether. So basically we're just getting rid of E, F, uh, G, and H. And... Um, we're replacing them with A, B, C, and D as appropriate. So that doesn't, shouldn't give you any problems. And uh, so now you know how to go from a primitive flow table to a reduced flow table. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.